Goedag, we gaan dit. My name is Wildcard. Thank you for watching the Wildcard Rugby Show. As always, it is my pleasure and privilege to talk about the reigning, defending, the undisputed world champions, the Springboks, and the greatest game in the world, rugby. Yes, this is the review for Chasing the Sun 2, episode 1. We are going out of order, back to the beginning, back to the start. And throughout this episode, there was a lot of talk about what the Springboks means to the people of South Africa. I thought this would be a good time to tell you guys what the Springbok jersey means to me. Yes, I know, an Asian Australian guy wearing a Springbok jersey talking about rugby, one of the weirdest things you can find on YouTube. But here it is. Let me go back to the beginning. So, Australia used to have a policy called the White Australian Policy, and it is to keep mostly Asians out of the country. And Australia still is a very xenophobic country, especially towards Asians. And growing up in Australia, ah yes, I've been told a lot of, you know, derogatory terms, go back to your country, uh, all sorts of stuff. And that has always weighed like a shadow, like literally like a shadow hanging over your head that you cannot get rid of. It's like a stormy cloud that's going to pour bucket down on you at any time and there's no way to get rid of. And... I'd, I'd always had trouble with that, dealing with that. And, uh, you know, as growing up playing rugby, finding my, my passion, finding what I enjoy. Of course, like every rugby fan, you got to go back and watch the old Rugby World Cup games. Uh, just like everybody, I watched the 1995 Rugby World Cup where Nelson Mandela handed the Webb Ellis Cup to Francois Pina. And boy, ah, oh man, I, that was one of the... And that's, that was one of the most, I think, important moments, not in, in my life. One of the most, one of the, those, like, you know, light bulb going off in my head moments in my life. One, when, I, when I looked into the story of Nelson Mandela, and I couldn't believe what this guy was doing based on the story. He was he jailed for standing up for apartheid for 27 years. 27 years for standing up for apartheid. And then he was freed. And he could have easily came out and said, the Springbok, the Springboks is a symbol of apartheid. Got to get rid of it. It's, you know, we could be literally looking at today, the South African rhinos, maybe, right? Instead of the Springboks, it could literally be changed to the rhinos because of the history that he had uh, with apartheid. Uh, but no, Nelson Mandela did not do that. He came out and he put his hate. He put, you know, put his 27 years of suffering and, 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 you know, unimaginable suffering aside, and he ex put on the Springbok jersey himself and extended the olive branch to the entire country to come together and end apartheid. And I, you know, that's, you know, that is something I just, that's so beyond what an ordinary person can do. And that is just something that I don't think anybody alive today has has the the capability of doing anymore. I was just blown away by how much this guy what the, the, how much this how much you know acceptance acceptance how much forgiveness this this guy had in his heart to forgive and move on and just not putting putting hate aside and I thought, and I literally, after that, I thought, I, I haven't been in jail for 27 years. Why do I care if some guy tells me to go back to where you come from? Why do I care if someone calls me a derogatory term? You know, like, it's nothing. It's literally pales in comparison. I will forgive him. I will forgive the people say bad things about me. Tell me to go back to Asia. I will forgive them. Because it's, it's pales in comparison to what Nelson Mandela went through in his life. And that, at, from that moment, I realized the Springbok jersey is not just a, a jersey of a represents a nation that I, I'd never been to. It's a jersey that represents much more than that. It's a jersey that is, that, that it's literally, yeah, like, I, I don't even have the words for it. It's a jersey that is much greater than sport then it's much greater than sport than politics and everything. It's, it's something that, you know, 
I think everybody should strive towards, especially in the world today, with all the social media negativity and all that. And quite frankly, we're just never going to, I think, we, I don't think anybody in the world has capacity for that anymore. But this, uh, the jersey, for me, is always a reminder. That is how I should conduct my life and not go around and spread hate and, you know, divide division amongst people and just try to get my own ego uh, above everybody else, right? So that's why I have a spring Springboro jersey. And uh, yeah, so this episode started with, you know, <laughs> the Springboks in a bit of a trouble against England uh, before it was tracked back to before the, the Rugby World Cup where the Springboks, you know, coming out of winning the 2019 World Cup where 2023 had always been the plan since 2018. The pressure, the, you know, how, how what this means for South Africa, how they're going to build towards winning the Rugby World Cup again. Something that has never been done before in South Africa. And uh, yeah, that was... Uh, that was, you know, that, that was the, the beginning of everything of the entire series. So yeah, the, the, spring, the, the Springboks obviously walked into this game. They went back to the, the pools being drawn. And immediately, the Springboks was drawn into the pool of death, right? With Ireland, Scotland, uh, and, you know, South Africa. And also Tonga. The people tend to forget Tonga had, you know, international superstars returning to, to home. Like Charles Piertau playing for them. And, uh, you know, Tonga wasn't going to be a walkover themselves. And, you know, the pool of ultra death, one of, like, literally the toughest pool ever, straight from the get-go, the first game against Scotland is an elimination game for the Springboks. I don't think there has ever been a Rugby World Cup where the first game could determine your elimination uh, from the tournament. So, yeah, that's what the Springboks were facing. That's what the draw has been. And again, it just speaks testament of how smart, how much work Rassi Rasmus and the entire team has put in behind the scenes to get themselves to this win. I mean, we can, we're still here, you know, the pundits in the Northern Hemisphere complaining about the draw. Oh my God, the draw is so unfair. That's why we couldn't make it out of uh, the, 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 the quarterfinals because the pool is unfair to us. You know, we're going to do better. We're going to do better for the next, next Rugby World Cup. And, uh, you know, the same team that came out of the same pool won the whole thing. So really, it's just a skill issue, guys. It's just a skill issue. Don't blame the pool. Don't blame, don't blame the luck of the draw. Don't blame the rugby girls for putting you in the same pool as the Springboks. And, uh, you know, it's only you and your skills to blame. So, yeah, the, uh, you know, you can always, you know, the, the video went on to talk about, you know, what is, the, you know, what... The, the Rassi Rasmus in the interview talking about what it means for him to play for, for the Rugby World Cup, especially after winning the first already in 2019. It's very easy. You know what? Well, it's really hard for, for some for you to, 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 you know, they say like in fighting in UFC, uh, in, in all sort of like, like competition, it's easier to win the championship. It's much, much harder to defend it. Because once you win it, you just like, let yourself go, and you mentally, you, you lose that hunger, you lose that, you know, that, that discipline, and you lose that goal of reaching the top, you, it's, it's much, and then also, just by being at the top, everybody's coming for you, you're under so much more pressure, it's much harder to actually defend the championship, and Rasi Erasmus was talking about in this interview that, yeah, it's nice to hold the cup, like winning it in 2019, but he thinks that it's, it's nicer for him to see people at Joburg <laughs> celebrating and cheering. And he thinks that it's more important for him to win the Rugby World Cup for the South African people. And I thought, wow, that's, you know, that is the mentality of a champion. You know, that is, that is what the champions do to keep themselves on top. You know, it's, it's a completely different, uh, different, men, men, yeah, different environment, different mentality, a completely different ball game when you are the champion and Rassi Erasmus knew that and he sets that mindset not for himself but for the rest of his players to get themselves back on track for the Rugby World Cup title defense and as always it's all about details everything they pause through all the techniques of the players uh, that they're, they're going to be playing against it's all about managing the game time managing fatigue managing mental fatigue and uh, yeah immediately the first game against the 
against Scotland, they talked about Pierre Schumann and how and his scrummaging. They talk about his weaknesses when he was playing at the Bulls. He, they study his videos and they talk about how he struggles with the body height. They picked that out and they really wanted to work him over during the game for that body height. And that is why Ox Incha is so good because Incha is naturally a pretty short and stouty person, like 175, 173. And uh, yes, that body height is uh, uh, for Skuman is uh, naturally going to be an issue for him. When And we can see, we shall see later in the video as well. When this guy came onto the field, he was just, uh, was just a bit of game over for Skuman. And the, uh, yeah, and then obviously the Springboks, you know, a lot of these players as well, just overwhelmed with emotions when they're handed the cap to represent their country. Uh, Marco Zulu, Mapingpi, you know, Dion Fari couldn't believe it. He, he thought he would never have a chance to play for at a World Cup. He never played at a World Cup before. 37 at that point. He thought I was, you know, he never would imagine that he would represent, uh, his, represent his country as such an end end tail end of his career and you know just very emotional stuff for everybody and uh yeah it was just you know selections 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 it's all about the selections uh rassi rasmus was in the interview we're talking about uh dwayne vermulen and why he had him in the team and he, he said you know with when it comes to the older players they will have a calm ahead when it comes to the big decisions and you know the aura they bring to the rest of the team is really important to carry through that the tough times essentially, right? And you know th that is one of the reasons why he had Dwayne Vermeulen in the team. And you know Dwayne, as you know somebody that come from that background, a lot of pride of you know of the old days. Uh, it is a different environment under Rassi Rasmus. There's no starting players. There's no everybody is treated equally. There's no bench. There's no starting. There's no this and that. Everybody's treated equally in the team. Everything is transparent. And Dwayne Vermeulen, you know, openly talking about in this interview that he doesn't like to be on the bench. Like, you know, he wants to be in the starting team, but he agreed with Rassi Erasmus going into this before selections that he was just going to do everything Rassi wanted him to do. That is the best for the team and putting his own ego aside. Yeah, and that is, that is something that, again, just Rassi Erasmus' ability to manage the players you know, emotions, manage players, egos, and just setting the, the 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 right environment for everybody to to be on the same page, and no one is you know you know is is having a stigma of you know being on the bench, having the stigma of not playing in a big game. You know, no one is being overlooked. Everybody is equally important. And uh, yes, the video went on to talk about the pundits' reactions about the Springbok style of rugby, predictable and boring. And, uh, you know, putting people to sleep. Ian Foster was, you know, falling asleep watching the Lions tour. Uh, you know, and I, I thought, yeah, you know, it's, it is what it is. Got to build some excitement, right? Got to, you know, that, that is the sort of stuff that motivates the screen box, motivates people like Rassi Erasmus. And the next bit, again, I thought this is just like the hallmark of a, of a great person, of a great man. Uh, Rassi, after, you know, the Lions tour, Nick Berry incident was suspended for a year and then later on suspended again for you know for like a month or something but he was he came out in front of the whole team and apologized you know guys i fucked up i shouldn't have not have done that i put everybody i put my own ego and put everybody at a disadvantage everybody in this team at a disadvantage by getting myself suspended he did not go oh i was right everybody's wrong you know protecting his own ego he went I'm sorry, guys. I let you guys down. I couldn't be there to coach you for a year because of my mistake. Something that I should not have done. I mean, just standing up like that, no excuses. I thought was just, you know, I, I was, I thought I was just so much respect watching Rassi Rasmus apologizing to everybody in the team. And, and this was also you know, going to the Rugby World Cup. The Springboks was suffering from injuries. You know, don't have a you know, Andrew Pola was injured, like losing to all the a lot of their games in the in the in the in the going into the rugby world cup as well, and uh, yeah, there was a lack of goal kicker, and man, everybody is just on, a, on you know on a, a, a mentally, physically on a bit of a, a 
having a bit of a doubt, to say the least, about a spring box. There were fans like, you know, telling, throwing the jersey away and all that sort of stuff. Man, it was looking really rough out there. And this, uh, that just all compounds the pressure uh, going into this Rugby World Cup for, for Rassi Rasmus and his team. Then they went to a bit of a story about a man in the box and he's grown up in human stop. Human stop. And uh, yeah, I hope I pronounced that correctly. And how he was growing up, influenced and raised by his grandmother, really poor. And uh, he was given not a Springbok jersey. You know, I, I, I'm privileged to have the money to afford a Springbok jersey. He didn't even have the privilege to afford one. He had to just get a green shirt and pretend it, that was a Springbok jersey. Yeah, and uh, his grandma taught him discipline, taught him respect growing up. And that's something that he carries on him, as, uh, himself in the life as a professional rugby player. You know, and, and also then the game kind of went on to the uh, to the beginning of the kickoff before the, you know, the, the, the kickoff for the first game against um, against Scotland. Razi Rasmus talking in the change room. <laughs> I thought it was really funny one part. He was like, the only thing that works in South Africa, we are the only thing that works in South Africa. Everybody is I'm like, like the only functioning you know, only functioning entity in South Africa right now. And he was just like, we have to do it for the country. We have to do it and, you know, keep ourselves together for the, um, you know, you know, yeah, to keep, keep ourselves together and keep ourselves motivated and show the rest of the world that South Africans can, you know, function in some capacity. And then obviously the infamous away jersey, <laughs> the hideous away jersey. I mean, come on, as if the dark green and the dark blue is going to clash. The Springboks has like, Gold numbers, white shorts, gold collar. It's not going to be clashing at all with that full dark, you know, blue outfit from, uh, from, uh, from, from Scotland. I don't know why they had to wear that jersey. For Ireland, I can sort of understand that's bigger of a clash. But I didn't really understand why they had to wear that ugly, ugly, you know, away colors for this particular match against uh, Scotland. Anyway, the game started. There was a bit of argy bargy for <laughs> between Dialenda, D- 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 and then people started running in. And Evan Espes was like, "You know, I don't usually run in, but uh, pretty sure he always runs in." Evan, <laughs> it was just like an interview. I don't normally run in. <laughs> yes, you do, Evan. Uh, I will never forget. Your eyes almost popped out, and Alan Alatoa had to push it back into the socket for you. Okay, I never forget that. So, Evan. I'll let that one slide, okay? And then, uh, obviously, the kicking issue that was alluded to before the game, man of the block, struggling with his kicking. Um, left mi- Missing kicks left and right. The Springboks was bringing a lot of physicality, targeting Finn Russell a bit. But yeah, the game was just... couldn't. They just couldn't quite put the game away. And, you know, there was... Um, oh yeah, there was, uh, you know, there, there, was, yeah, there, there was a moment where the... The 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 uh, what do you call it? Uh, the the, uh, the the Scottish almost scored in the corner on the right hand side, and it was a nice cover from the box to, to stop that. And you know, and it was just teetering on the edge. The, the scoreboard wasn't big enough of a lead for Springboks to put in the game away. So it was just hanging in the balance going to half time. And then you know, Razi Rasmus, as the genius that he was, realizing what the, the the players were too tight, the players were too afraid. Because this is the elimination match, right? Everybody's just too, too on the nerve about this game. And he made a really interesting call here. He told the players to uh, that it's okay to have a knock-on. But just really have a go. And have a vibe. You know, get your energy together. Have a go. Right? Like, it's just something that I thought was just so brilliant. Like, you know, it's not something that, you know... It's, very rarely do you hear a coach to tell the players it's okay to knock on the ball, right? Just have a go. But he, he realized that's the the, the mentally the, the he can tell the players are just too tight and they're f- afraid and they're and that tightness was actually causing the errors. And once he said that, players started to relax a bit and the, 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 you know that that allowed the team to be a little bit more fluid as well. And then obviously the uh, the bomb score coming onto the field. This guy. Immediately destroys, um, uh, what's his name, Skuman, uh, and uh, uh, what is his name, Z- Fagus, <laughs> Xander Faguson, and you know everything was on the rise again for the Springboks. And one of the the, the main thing was that the um, 
the the the, the, the kicking was still an issue. The and then the Springbok team decided that Faf the Clerk would take over the kicking duties just to free up the block a bit more time to do what he does best, which is being the five eight, play the ball, you know, playing passing the ball, being the the the, the, the playmaker, right? And sure enough, with that burden taken off his shoulders. One of the most beautiful plays in, in Rugby World Cup this year. No look, cross through kick, straight in the bread basket of Curdy Arensa, try into the corner. It was just like magic, absolute magic. And uh, yeah, it was, that's what it is. And then um, the interview, uh, this guy wearing glasses, I think it's Damien Vilimsa wearing glasses, but it's I'm pretty sure it's some, some nerd that looks like Damien Vilimsa. And he was just like, oh, he was like watching a movie, man. He was like watching uh, something from a video again. But I mean, who, who is this nerd? Where's Damien Valimsa? What did you guys do to Damien Valimsa? What? Anyway. Anyway. Moving on. Moving on. Damien Valimsa. Why are you wearing glasses? Why? Anyway. Moving on. Moving on. So, uh, after the match, the Springboks won. Ksia Khaleesi was asked again about the kicking issues from man in the box and i thought the way that sia khaleesi answered this question uh even at a time after the world cup i thought it was during the world cup i thought it was so, such a class it really shows like the quality of person that sia khaleesi really is he was just like you know we're a team everybody we work at more than one kicker if one person is not having a good day someone else who help out would, would take over it's true i'm pretty sure you know, LeBoc against the All Blacks kicked like 100% like the, 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 the week or two before in the trial match. So it's not like he can't kick it. It was just having an off day. I see a Khaleesi even further and say, you know, sometimes on the field, me as the captain, I don't know what to, what to do. And other players help me out on, on what decision to make. You know, Dwight will make a, make a decision. Evan Edsworth will make a decision. Man in the box will make a call. I don't even know. But that's what we do as a team. We help each other out. Uh, no one is above another. And then I thought that was just such a, you know, and in fact, he got like applause or something from the crowd, from the, from the, uh, from the, from the, what do you call it? From the media people, from the, you know, from the journalists that were, were like applauding him after this, what he said here. I thought it was, yeah, like just, just shows the quality that Sia Khaleesi brings to the table. And, uh, and the Rassi Rasmus at this point was saying, hey, you know, I still didn't, wasn't think the last thing on his mind right now is to replace the fly half. He thought the kicking would just sort itself out with man in the box. And uh, he still had full confidence in man in the box after this game against uh, against Scotland. And uh, yeah, and it all it all comes down to manage the players' workload. And the show ended with them going, oh, what's going on? What's wrong? Oh, something's wrong at the camp. Oh, let me guess what it is. Oh. Spoiler alert. Should I spoil? Spoil it? Spoiler alert. Um, it's, it's a, it's, it's, I don't know why they think this will be a, um, a, uh, a, 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 what is it, with a cliffhanger? Because everybody knows, right? It's the injury to Malcolm Marks that everybody's worried about, that everybody's reacting to. I don't know why they're like, oh my god, something happened, oh, find our next episode. Oh. I mean, unless you're, uh, I don't know, a, unless, you know, you're a, uh, Irish pundit or New Zealand pundit who don't watch was watching this for the first time uh they might think oh my god what's going on but i think everybody else in the world who watches rugby knows what happened at this point so yeah spoiler alert Malcolm Marx gets injured and that will go into the next episode so yeah that's the end of that review uh thanks for watching guys let me know your thoughts about what the Springboks jersey means to you, I guess. And uh, let me know your thoughts about this episode, the first episode of Chasing the Sun 2. And uh, like, comment, subscribe. And uh, I'll see you guys in the comment section. And uh, thanks for watching. Like, and uh, yeah, feel free to buy a, buy a t-shirt or whatever. And uh, have a good day. I'll see you guys tomorrow for the news. Cheers.